Hi everyone. So welcome to lecture one. This is going to correspond to chapters one and two in the Hazrat text. And the way I'm going to do this is we're going to go through some of the ideas that show up in chapters one and two, and I'm going to demonstrate those ideas by implementing them in this notebook. And when the lecture is over, I will take the notebook and I will post it as well as the lecture on the course canvas page. Now I'm going to assume that everybody has already watched the orientation video for Mathematica and knows something about the way notebooks work and the conventions that Mathematica uses for both function naming and for the input for functions. And I'll be pointing those things out as I go through as well. So we're going to start by looking at how to use Mathematica as a calculator. So just the basic manipulation of numbers and variables, and then we're going to talk about how functions are derived. In the lecture that follows this one, we're going to talk about lists and list manipulation. And from there, we can start talking about how looping works in Mathematica, which is maybe slightly different than you're used to. So to begin with, let's talk about Mathematica as a calculator. So to get used to some of the notation that Mathematica uses, let's just do some computations. Typical of programming languages, if I write something like 5 plus 3 plus 2, we're going to have a, an order of operations that's imposed by Mathematica. Now, when I write code in Mathematica, I can always execute it by holding down the shift and pressing the enter key. And when I do that, you'll see the evaluation. As a general note, when you're working through a computation and you have an output that you want to manipulate that you didn't store in a variable, which we haven't talked about yet, I want to point out that we can actually refer to previous outputs in uh, two different manners. The first thing we can do is we can use the uh, percent sign, and that calls the last output back up as something that you could refer to. You can also call the output variable with reference to the numbers inside of it. So you'll see if you look at the outputs that mine says out2. If I called out2 and hit enter, then again, out2 has that 17 stored inside of it, the result of that computation. While we're here, I should point out that functions in Mathematica always start with capital letters. So Mathematica can handle computations of pretty incredible size. So this, this number is, uh, it's, it's quite large. It just keeps going, going, and going, and going, and going. And so Mathematica has got a pretty high degree of precision in a lot of these things. So one thing that's very easy to do with Mathematica is to check that a number that you've produced has a property that you, that you want. So in a lot of contexts in mathematics, you might want to know that a certain number is prime. And Mathematica has software, or and Mathematica has functions built in that can do that for you. So let's generate a number like, I don't know, 2 to the 9,940th, and let's subtract 1 from it. So again, this is an enormous number. It's an odd number. And suppose that you wanted to know if that number was prime. Well, there are many operations in Mathematica, Boolean operations, that produce true or false results that will tell you about properties that a particular number might have. Frequently, the Q is attached to those functions. It's a query. So this is a function that's asking, is the number that you've input prime? And in this case, the number is not prime. So there's an important thing to know about the way that Mathematica handles numbers, which is that it wants to keep numbers in the most precise form possible. So if you ask Mathematica to evaluate something like 22 divided by 7, it will just spit 22 divided by 7 back at you. If you want that number to be written in a numerical form for a computation, you can always force Mathematica to give you an approximation with the command n, which is a numerical command. So n for numerical. This is a very common thing to have to do. Mathematica likes to preserve this sort of precision when it can. But most of the time when we're dealing with approximations or graphing, we don't actually need the symbolic form of an answer or the precise form. We need some sort of actual numerical approximation that we can deal with. There's one last complication in the way that Mathematica approaches expressions that frequently needs to be overcome in order to test equations or other characteristics of a function that you're working with, which is that Mathematica by default does not do a very deep simplification routine on expressions that you feed it. So let's look at, for example, something like the tangent of 3 pi over 11 plus 4 times the sine of 2 pi over 11. Now, if you evaluate that, you'll notice that you've got an expression in terms of cotangent and sine. 
Nothing seems like it's really changed here. Nothing's been evaluated, and if there's an underlying identity at play, we don't see it. Mathematica has done very little to this expression. If we want to see if this can be mathematically reduced into something less complicated, then we actually have to tell Mathematica that we want it to do that. And the way we do that is one of the most common commands that you'll use, which is the command simplify. So if we simplify the previous output, well, nothing changed. Well, maybe we know something must change. We've got suspicions that there's some sort of identity that could be applied here. So now we run the even stronger command, full simplify. And again, we'll run out on output 10, so we haven't changed anything. And now you'll notice that Mathematica brings all of its power to bear and reduces that expression to root 11. So again, what we did here was we started with this expression uh, combining tan and sine. When Mathematica evaluated it, it gave us back the same expression. And it didn't simplify that expression either. It wasn't until we hit it with the full simplify routine that it managed to reduce that expression to what that expression actually equals. So if you're working on something in Mathematica and it doesn't reduce the way that you think it should, full simplify or simplify are very common commands to have to apply to the output of operations. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how Mathematica manages numbers and operations on numbers. Now, all of the common operations are here. We've already seen the basic arithmetic operations. Things like factorials are very natural. Um, in fact, I've produced a factorial here, 24. Well, suppose I want to know what its factors are. Well, we have basic commands like factor integer, factor integer to separate it from factor polynomial, which we'll see later. If you factor the integer, you get a list. Now, the list here is telling you both the number that is inside and the multiplicity of that number. So this is a prime factorization, and you can read here that this is a prime factor of 2 with multiplicity 3 and a prime factor of 3 with multiplicity 1, which is to say that it's telling you that if you did 2 times 2 times 2 times 3, and hopefully don't put a slash mark on the end, that you get 24 back again. Okay. Now that's in a list environment, and it's a list of lists. And we'll talk about how to manipulate lists of lists later. But it's very easy to do. Now, I already showed you the test to see if a number is prime or not. That's prime q. So is 24 prime? Clearly not. So we get false as expected. Because prime numbers are so important in so many areas of mathematics, Mathematica has a built-in command for producing the prime numbers. So if you use the command prime and you look at what it says, well, the prime command is telling you what the nth prime number is. It's a function. You can call it. So if you call up, say, prime 1, if you actually do your syntax correctly, that's 2. Suppose you want to know what the 10th prime is. So 10th prime of the list is 29. And this list just goes and goes and goes. It's actually many questions and hypotheses that are interesting about prime numbers can be worked with in Mathematica because it's got this built-in array of the primes. Other common operations that you would have seen in earlier classes include things like modular arithmetic. That's very easy to do in Mathematica because you get a two-argument command where you have to tell it the number that you are beginning with and the number that you are dividing it by. Remember that modular arithmetic produces remainders. So if you did 13 mod 6, we should expect the remainder to be 1, and indeed it is. Again, in keeping with the standard methodology in Mathematica, we have a command with a capital letter and inputs that are enclosed inside square brackets. And because this is a two command or a two input command, we separate those with a comma. Because the beginning of this class is going to be focused on number theoretic questions or the manipulation of numbers, things like modular arithmetic and prime numbers and uh, the combinations, right, the binomial coefficients are going to be um, used heavily. And so we're also going to be using the command that's called binomial. So binomial is the choose command. So you can think of this as 10 choose 2. If I wanted to compute 10 choose 2, binomial 10 2 is that. Binomial 10 choose 2 is that. Now, because Mathematica is a symbolic language, 
it's very good at algebraic computations, not just numerical computations. Everything we've done up to now has been sort of numerical formula. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about how Mathematica is at manipulating algebraic expressions. And it's quite good at that. So in Mathematica, if you don't define what a symbol means, Mathematica treats it as a variable expression. That is, if it's undeclared, it stays a symbolic expression. So if you do something like 1 plus x to the fourth, and you ask Mathematica to evaluate that, it will leave it in that form. But it will also expand it for you, if you like. And it multiplies it out symbolically. Likewise, if you ask Mathematica to factor a polynomial expression, it will do so. And it's pretty good at it. It's not capable of factoring things that can't be factored, but it's very good at picking out regular expressions and crushing things down. So if you feed it something like 1 plus 3x to the third plus 3x to the sixth plus x to the ninth, say, it should be able to produce an expression for you that that factors into. So one of the more useful things you can do with Mathematica, if you happen to be a calculus student or a differential equation student, student doing partial fractions, is take advantage of the fact that Mathematica has got a very nice built-in routine for doing partial fractions. So everyone's seen things like terrible expressions like x plus 2 divided by x plus 3 squared times x squared plus 1. And then if you want to take an expression like that and expand it out in terms of a's, b's, and c's so you can integrate it, that's a very terrible thing to have to do. Um, I've actually used this quite a bit because I've taught a lot of these classes. And so one of the nicest things you can do with a rational expression like this is use the Mathematica command apart. And what a part will do is give you the partial fraction decomposition of what you started with. And that's a beautiful thing. Sort of thing that calculus students wish they had access to. So Mathematica deals with variables in the typical way. You write a letter, you set it equal to some number. If you want to suppress the output when you do that, you can say t is equal to 3 and put the semicolon after it. It will suppress the output. That's really important when you're assigning things over loops, for example. So get used to using your semicolons. Um, now, one thing that shows up when you've assigned a variable, you notice now when I write the variable t, it's not blue anymore. It's not blue because Mathematica knows what t is. t is 3. And so if you decided that you were working algebraically and you wanted to expand something like 1 plus t to the third, you don't get an algebraic expression anymore. You get a number because t has been assigned the value of 3. If you want that to go away, you don't want t to be 3 anymore, you want t freed up to be var a variable again, you can use the command clear, and that will remove t as a variable. You notice now all the t's are blue again, which tells you t is unassigned. It's a quantity that has nothing assigned to it, and so it's once again a symbolic quantity. And if you run the same command, now you're going to get the algebraic expansion. Okay, That is something that shows up all the time when you're working with a programming language like this especially in math, where we tend to use the same symbols over and over again for uh, different problems. Okay, So it's one of the first things to check if something is going weird in something you're programming is that you're not using a variable that you've already used someplace else. And that's especially important in Mathematica because variables stay defined across notebooks. They only drop out of memory when you either clear them or you restart Mathematica. Okay, so you've already seen two of them, but there are three different kinds of equal signs in Mathematica. Actually, secretly there's four, but we're just gonna look at three of them right now. There's the single equal sign, which is variable assignment. So when we do variable assignment, that's a single equal sign, and that ends up looking like we just did, right? T is equal to three. If I look at T and I evaluate it, it turns into a three. So T and three are the same thing at this point. The second is the Boolean check. So, if I want to check that uh, there's a Boolean comparison, that's two equal signs. So I could ask right now, is t equal to 3? And it's going to be true because t and 3 are the same. If I ask the computer, is t equal to 4? It's going to tell me false because I've defined t to be equal to 3. The third type of equal sign is called a delayed assignment. And what that does is it 
holds off on evaluating whatever's on the right hand side, whatever's been stuck into that variable until input has been processed. So it waits to figure out what t or x is equal to until you actually call x. So to give you an idea of like exactly what that means, what that looks like, if you wrote down something like x is equal to random x, well, let's look at what the random function does. If I just do random and I call it, what comes out? That's a random number between 0 and 1. If I call it again, I get a different random number. And every time I call random, I get a different number. If I'm working with a delayed assignment or a variable assignment, and I just let x be equal to random, that gets called once. x gets evaluated right now. The random number gets generated and stuck inside of x. And no matter how many times I call x, I get the same number back again. It might be the case that I want x to be a different random number every time I call it. And to do that, I can assign x to be the delayed assignment random. And if now if I evaluate x, I get a different random number every time I call it because the assignment of the value of x is delayed until after I evaluate whatever was plugged in there. And that's going to be the core of defining functions, which is the next thing that we're going to talk about. One of the more powerful things you can do with Mathematica is built out of something called the manipulate environment. And what manipulate does is it lets you slide the values of a variable around and change the computations of some object in terms of that value. So let me see if I can show you exactly what I mean by that. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up what's called the manipulate command. And now I need to tell manipulate what it is that I'm interested in manipulating. What expression do I want to compute that I want to change as a dynamic variable changes? So you can put pretty much anything inside a manipulate environment, which is kind of awesome. So let's suppose that we expand the expression 1 plus x, and let's raise it to the nth power. That expansion right now doesn't do anything because the n isn't defined and the x isn't defined. But what we can do is we can tell it that the variable that I want to change is the variable n. And I would like that variable n to take on values between 1 and 10. And I want the step size to be 1. Okay, So all I've done here is I've said that you have n is supposed to be what's being manipulated. The n values run between 1 and 10. And the step size is 1. So manipulate is a command that you can read more closely on and get used to. But that's what's happening here. If you do that, you get a slider for n, and you notice that the output is dynamically created based on what you've done with the value of n. So now n is 2, and now n is 3. And as you keep increasing the value of n, the expansion continues to calculate a different polynomial. So the value of n here can be manipulated, and the command that you're changing or the command that you're computing changes in correspondence with how you set the sliders up. So I'm going to introduce a command you haven't seen yet to show you something about like why this is so cool, why these dynamic environments are so awesome. So let's look at the manipulate command, but now let's manipulate a plot. So the plot command in Mathematica looks like this, and we're going to be going way into depth on plots later. So I'm just going to give you an idea of how plotting works. So we're going to plot the function, say, 1 plus x squared between x is equal to 0 and 4. And if you do that, you get the standard plot of a parabola. Now suppose you want to know how the plot of the parabola changes with different values of a, different coefficients and, and that, that you can manipulate here. Well, you could put a c right here. And of course, if you ask Mathematica to do that, it will do nothing because c doesn't mean anything. But if you put that inside a manipulate environment and you tell Mathematica that you'd like the c values to range between, say, minus 3 and 3, now as you manipulate this constant c, you're going to get different values of the parabola. And at some point what happens is the parabola flips signs because you've gone from negative value of c where the parabola opens down to a positive value of c where the parabola opens up. This is actually more interesting if you involve higher level functions. But the basic idea here is that I've put a slider in this thing that lets me control the coefficient in terms of the x squared term. And you can actually do more than that. The way that this is set up, you could tell it that you want a values too. 
So Manipulate is more than happy to give you multiple sliders for whichever values you want to be able to manipulate in a given graph. Okay, This is incredibly useful when you're doing explorations of functions and families of graphs. Okay, So the dynamic variable package inside of here is incredibly powerful and useful in many, many, many contexts. So the last thing I want to leave you with uh, as sort of an introduction to how Mathematica works, it, just as of the basics that we need in order to start delving into more complicated problems, is how we build new functions out of old ones and how we make them so they can be evaluated. So the most straightforward way that you can take a mathematical formula and turn it into a function in Mathematica is with the following syntax. So you take a function name, whatever you want to call it, I'll use f, I guess, and give it some variable. The variable name here is a dummy variable name. It's just used for the definition of the function. But it's important that you put an underscore after it because you're telling Mathematica at that point that when you define a function, that the n is the blank that's going to be used to fill in the formula that you're going to define on the right hand side of this. When you're defining a function, you have to use delayed assignment. So you're saying to Mathematica, I want you to figure out what the input value is and then plug it in and evaluate it and then assign that value. Now we can just build an expression. Since we've chosen n as our variable, we can define something like n to the third minus 2n plus 3. Notice that we have green letters n and that they're italicized, which means that Mathematica knows that we're defining a function right now. You evaluate that with shift enter like normal, and now you've got a function that you can call. So f of 3 is 24, f of 4 is 59. If you like, you could plot it. If you like, you can plot it. Yeah, don't, don't leave the variables off of your plots. Generally, this is how you work with formulas. Okay, It's very straightforward to define a mathematical formula as a a mathematical formula as a mathematica function. Now, a powerful thing that you can do once you have functions defined is you can feed a function into itself. So composition of functions is dead easy, right? Just f of f, f of f of f. They'll happily keep doing that. And yeah, that's kind of ugly. So if you want, you could simplify it. And it would probably multiply it out and combine like terms, maybe not. OK, is that really any better? I don't know, but at least that's a polynomial now. So functions are easy to compose because you can just feed them into other functions. A mathematical function can also be defined in terms of pieces of existing functions. So you could define f of x to be equal to something like the sine of x times the cosine of x plus the tangent of x. And that's a perfectly valid thing to be able to do. Um, I don't actually know what this looks like, so let's see. What I'm doing now is I'm specifying the domain. There are many, many options inside the plot command. Like I said, we'll go into it in great, much greater depth later on. OK, so it basically looks like a slightly modified tangent. OK, so what do we've sort of covered in this overview introduction to the basic operations of Mathematica? Well, we talked about arithmetic. And in particular, plus, minus, divide, times, factorial, and so on. We also talked about how to do algebra. So we talked about functions like the expand function, the factor function, the apart function. If you want to put something over a common denominator, there's a function called together. All of these things should be looked at, and you should look more closely in the book because it goes into more detail about all these things. We talked about the different kinds of equals. So we talked about equals versus double equals versus delayed equals or colon equals. We talked about Boolean functions. For example, prime q, which says is a number prime or not prime. And we talked about formulas into functions. And as part of that, we talked about the manipulate environment, which is a very useful environment to be looking at. So we talked about a little bit more than that, but that's the basis for what we did. Now, if you want to know when you read the text, 
and you come away from this lecture what it is that you were supposed to have learned in total. The lectures are supposed to give you an overview of what some of the common questions and syntax uh, ideas and the way of thinking about mathematical problems that come up in thinking about programming. The book is supposed to go into more detail about the catalog of functions that you're supposed to learn. And if you want to know the precise functions that you are supposed to be familiar with and to be able to use, you should check the homework one PDF for the first week's functions to learn. So there's a list at the top of the homework assignment that will tell you what you're supposed to come away from the first week having known. Now there's some big ideas that we have not done yet that we're going to do in the next lecture. So right now we are good to start with the homework corresponding to chapter. So you, after this lecture, can do the homework from chapter one and the homework exercises corresponding to chapter 2.1. We have not yet talked about chapter 2.2, which is about anonymous functions, and we have not talked about chapter three, which is about lists. Those will be the content of the next lecture. So get started on this. If you have questions about the problems or the worksheet, uh, please feel free to ask me. And uh, I hope this introduction to the basic operations of Mathematica has been useful. If you have questions about anything I did or things that you think I missed that need to be talked about, let me know so that I can produce more of these videos. And then hopefully I can interact with you on a more dynamical, or dynamic, like the variable, I guess, dynamic basis in the Slack channel and in the office hours uh, where we can discuss the particulars of programming for your specific concerns. Okay. This has been fun. I'll talk to you next time.